Good evening, everybody. I'm Derek Misho, and it is time to go flush in the pocket. And tonight, this is a huge one. We have a two-time PBA Player of the Year, PBA and USBC Hall of Famer, 35 titles, including three majors, the USBC Masters or ABC Masters in 2001, the uh, 2012 PBA World Championship, and the 2015 Players Championship. And I, you know, I pinch myself every day that I get to call this guy a friend. None other than PBA legend Parker Bowen III. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great, Derek. How are you tonight? I am doing very well. And thank you so much for doing this. Well, you're quite welcome. Awesome. So uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, you know, feel free in the chat and uh, we'll get started. So I guess the first question is, how was that brutal U.S. Open for you? Oh, my God. I'll tell you, you know, you, you sign up for the U.S. Open. You have to understand that, you know, the conditions are going to be challenging going in. Not only are they going to be challenging, but you have to put it in your head. When you miss left or right, you're probably going to pay for it. And that certainly was the case for most of the competitors this week. And I don't care who they were or what they were or how many hands they had on a ball. OK, mm -hmm. so uh, I'll just say this, that the, the first day was extremely challenging for the fact that every time I missed a smidge left, I was looking at flagging the head pin for six. Now, you think that the one, three, six, nine would not be very challenging until you go to shoot at it like I typically would. And when my ball gets to the second half of the lane, it's tailing off or backing up. So therefore, chops became inevitable. After I missed it quite a few times, it wasn't very long before I started shooting that with my regular strike ball, keeping it online. At least then the ball wouldn't tail away from the head pin. It would actually get to the left, to the right side of it, rather. And fortunately, filling the frame or making the spare and moving along. But, you know, 100 under after the first day, both of my boys were ahead of me. Uh, I both struggled the last two games of the second block to shoot another 70 under. And uh, that didn't make me feel very good because I was actually bowling pretty decent that block, even if you want to say the first six games. But uh, needless to say, I was 180 under after day two. And uh, my one son was ahead of me and, and my other son was behind me. And then day three, I actually bowled very good. I almost had high block of the of the day. Wow. Uh, but a couple of 160s kept me away from that. Got uh, Got back to respectable when I say I finished 45 under. And uh, anybody that knows bowling in the U.S. Open 45 under, I will take my mm -hmm. score and move along. So just just so people know, under, I can explain this. You can explain this. I just learned this a few years ago. Uh, it's it's kind of like a par in golf. Uh, two, it's based off of 200. You shoot 245, you're plus 45. You shoot 145, you're minus 55. So uh, that's how that works. And then, of course, if you bowl, uh, and I'm not trying to step on you or anything like that. Nope. Um, if, uh, you bowl two games and you shoot, uh, I don't know, 250 and then, uh, 270, then you're plus what, 120 or whatever. If my math is correct, um, Derek, I gotta be quite honest here. We're doing this. This is a friend to a friend. If you shoot 250, 270 at the U S open, you're going in for a drug test. They're going to make you pee in a cup. <laughs> Well, okay. Yeah, sure. No, I'm just throwing it out there. Now, let me ask you this. So, um, the, uh, what were the, you know, we're both, I guess, Brunswick staffers. I'm unofficially, but, uh, you know, I mean, everybody considers me a Brunswick staffer because I wear the shirts, throw the balls. What, what were the balls of choice this week? You're the guy, actually. I'm the guy. So, you're the guy. That, the, you're the Brunswick guy up there, especially Sweet. in Maine. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Uh, but balls of choice, you know, there it was, um, I I'll say the pink widow uh, mm -hmm. ended up to be one. Obviously, the purple hammer was mm -hmm. another one. Uh, I threw the black widow just for a little bit, trying to look at something there. Obviously, I had the, the new red pearl widow. It seems like widow seemed like ball of choice, if you want to say. Sure. Uh, at least somebody would think that. But between that we were trying to throw the stealth down the lane a little bit uh 
you know, I had one or two other balls that were in there that maybe made some cameo appearances here and there, mm. but it was just a matter of the defender hybrid. That's what mm. I bowled really good with the last day. Mm. So that ball seemed to see the lane very well. And uh, needless to say, I, I just kept right on trucking along using it. Yeah. Well, there you go. And as friend to a friend to a friend, you should have just switched right-handed if you were struggling, you know, yeah, just, <laughs> just, just thought I'd throw it out there. It was not going to help my score. Trust me. <laughs> Um, so what, what did you think of the format of the U S open? So a lot of people, okay. So here, here's where a lot of people had problems. Mookie bets bowling the U S open. First off the fact that there was a PTQ, there's, I guess shouldn't have been, you know, I mean, when was the last time there was a PTQ at a U.S. open, it should be mm-hmm. the U S open. Anybody, if I want to, if, if I want to spend, what was a $500 entry fee or whatever it was, Correct. if I want to pay $500 and just experience it. I should be able to, or at least have a 200 average. Um, then, um, if I want to have a 200 average, then, uh, or if I have a 200, have a 200 average and want to try it, I should be able to. Um, but, uh, Jimmy Allen bowling it, uh, Mookie Betts bowling it. They don't really need to, they don't need the money. I think it should be meant, you know, for people that the, the money can, uh, it could change if hundred. If I give you a hundred thousand dollars right now, Parker, I bet it would change your life. I, you know, I bet it would, you know, yeah. What did you think? Well, there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. Uh, the first way of looking at it is it brings some more notoriety and press to bowling's U S open. And when I say that, uh, typically any press is good press. So if we can bring or attract the media to come out to any one of our PBA events. It doesn't matter the significance of the event. Obviously, this is major significance. Uh, or if it's a smaller event, such as a local PBA regional. Mm. If the press comes out there and talks about bowling and puts it in the paper, then for the most part, it's going to be really good for the sport of bowling. Mm. Okay? And so that's the first way that I would look at this. The second way that I would look at it is from a player perspective. Okay, the guys that are in this tournament basically are the guys that are in the top 75 or let's say past champions or members of Team USA. Now, somebody might have a problem with members of Team USA. I do get that and I respect that because some of the members on Team USA and I'm going to use a case in point. I'm going to start with my own two boys. Okay, Mm -hmm. they had a birth into this. They did have to pay their entry. It wasn't like it was given to them for free. And at the end of the day, USBC slash BPAA uh, really have their hand in controlling this entire event. Okay. It was mainly run by the USBC. It was all of their staff that run the US, the, that run Bowling's US Open. So when you look at that, the significance behind it, they're giving people that have really put their heart and soul into the sport, although they're not on tour in that top 75 they're certainly showing themselves out in the bowling forefront that they're the player of today. Some of us, and I'm going to use me as an example, I was the player of yesterday. Matter of fact, somebody might say two decades ago yesterday, not so much yesterday, meaning, you know, last month. But when we look at somebody like Mookie Betts, obviously, uh, you know, here's a guy that's got bowling through thick and thin. But he's a superstar athlete in another sport. Is $100,000 going to change his life? No, it's not. But he is definitely very much a bowler, you know. Now, when we look at uh, Mr. Allen there, when it Mm -hmm. comes to him being in in part of it, I know that he's just kind of come onto the scene. He certainly is a bowler. But he he did take the back seat and decided to bowl the PTQ. And if he would have gotten out of the PTQ into the main tournament, you know what? He earned that right at that point. So as the way that things turned out, I think it was very good for all. I do know that guys are out there making a living. And let's face it, if they're not in this main tournament, that's one less opportunity for them to make a living. But at the same time, they had that same opportunity to sign up to be in the PTQ Mm -hmm. to get a spot into there. And if they didn't sign up, then, well, I hate to say it, but shame on them at that point. So we're going to wrap up the U.S. Open in just a second. Um, so 
let me ask you this are you a good singer the reason i ask is because carrie underwood jimmy allen's on tour with carrie underwood and you know i know this because i'm a country guy and i i'm a disc jockey internet disc jockey as well um <clears throat> and uh, we got, we've got a couple questions in the chat we'll get to in a second but it you know if jimmy made the telecast or did well uh you might have had to go on tour with carrie underwood would you have been able to handle that no yeah. chance i can't i can't hold the tune okay <laughs> anybody that knows me my family my friends they all know if i start to even think of singing please shut up now mm. okay <laughs> <laughs> now what did you think of the oil patterns now i don't i know of a couple of them i know that the first one was 49 feet flat yes uh do you think that that was like bowling in san quentin or i mean was that was uh, how hard was that would do you think that oh, was it, too tough it, it was extremely difficult there i'm not even going to sugarcoat it but uh you know do i think it was too tough uh let's put it this way whether you're bowling on one foot of oil or you're mm -hmm. bowling on 60 feet of oil, mm -hmm. if you throw the ball properly, you're going to knock over 10 pins. Mm -hmm. And if you leave any type of spare, and I hate to say it, but I'm going to use seven, 10 or big four. Mm -hmm. They're obviously they're, they're very challenging or nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. and, but minus those types of spares, anything else is very possibly it can be made. Okay. I made did make a 710 mm -hmm. this week when I bowled at the US Open. I it was luck. I know that. You know, you hit the one pin, you got to hit it properly and hope that it bounces out. And for me, it did. Um, I made I bowled a tournament today. I actually made the Greek church. So the Greek church is a makeable spare. The big four and, and stuff of that nature, you're hitting it and you're hoping that it bounces out. You can't plan on those things. But let's face it. Most of those players, myself included, because I missed cashing by about 80 pins. If I make my spares, Derek, I get to the pay window. And I don't say that very often, buddy. But I will tell you right now, I probably missed in all, I'm going to say maybe 10 spares. And most of them were that first day when I kept chopping the, the rail when I, when I missed a head pin. But it still falls on me. And there's nobody to blame but me at the end of the day. So of the four patterns, if you were, if you were to, you know, if the U S open is your tournament, you're running it of those four patterns, which one would you have put out? If you, you only put out one for the whole entire tournament, which one would you put out? I think the true U S open deserves to be on a flat pattern. Okay. okay so, uh, you know, uh, the shorter one that I believe it was 38 feet or 39 feet. I don't have that here in front of me now yeah. that, appears to be the safest or the best for everybody. When I say the safest or the best, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you put 49 feet out, rev rate's probably going to allow you to hit it a tiny bit more. Now, mm -hmm. what is the definition of a tiny bit? Maybe it's 30 pins, maybe it's 50 pins over the block, but your rev rate and your power can very possibly supersede on one or two of those pairs. It mm -hmm. can also get you in trouble. Let me say that. It can definitely get you in trouble. You know, whereas the 39 foot pattern, whether mm -hmm. you go straight, whether you hook it, whether you have a high rev rate or lower, mm -hmm. everybody's ball has an opportunity to pick up and or change direction in some way, shape or form. To me, that pattern allows all players and all styles to play. All right. So I just want to let everybody know Parker's a good friend of mine. So I have to say this, his bowling, every bowling lane he was on, he had four chairs on the lane. And when he made the seven ten, he used two balls and you know, no, I'm just kidding. Hey, good job. <laughs> good job this week. Listen, uh, I know it's hard for you. And, uh, you know, I know that, uh, your, I guess prime, like you said, uh, you know, yesteryear or the, or the late nineties, early two thousands. I'm proud of you. I just want you to know that. I'm very well, proud of you. Well, thanks, bud. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, you did have a pretty nice career on tour. So let's dive into it. What was your best moment on tour? Best individual moment? Whatever you want. Let's do, would, let's do a couple. It would have to be by far winning the 2012 uh, World Championship out in Las Vegas. You know, uh, Derek... Anybody that lives up and down the East Coast remembers that little thing. Uh, I say little thing, this little storm called Superstorm Sandy. Mm -hmm. uh, it pretty much devastated 
uh, the East Coast there. And the vast majority of it destroyed really close to our our home, about 30 minutes away, the Jersey Shore. So up and down the Jersey Shore got really wrecked. Uh, many people lost their homes. Obviously, some people lost their businesses. Um, unfortunately, there were people that perished during that time frame. And it shut a lot of things down. Well, I didn't know that I would get to that sto- that tournament because mm-hmm. we had lost power. And although our home was completely fine, it did take me a day to clean up my house, which when you think about it, is really nothing because my house was still intact. People 30 minutes from me were losing their houses. The guy that was my neighbor, because I've moved in the last two years, but the gentleman that was my neighbor, he had two trees come down over top of both of his cars in his driveway. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was Mm -hmm. just coincidence. Why his place and why not mine? So I feel like I got out of there pretty much scot-free, if you want to call it at at that. But then uh, power came back on at the last minute and I was able to go out and bowl the tournament. Well, who would have known when I went out there that I would get as deep as I did without practicing prior to missing half of the practice sessions. And then I find myself collecting the check and trophy. Did you start off strong or were you like bowling 180, 190, and then you had to get your legs under you and then now, okay, now the two thirties, two forties or whatever, whatever you were shooting, you know, started coming. Believe it or not, there were four individual events during that tournament and I did not make any of the individual cuts. I snuck into the big tournament in 24th place. Mm Mm-hmm. And then when match play started, I had one good round of match play. Then I had another good round of match play and I kept climbing the ladder. And ultimately I did not get into the TV show until the last game when the last ball was thrown. That's when I snuck into fifth place. And then who would have known, uh, you know, all the stars being in a line, I was Mm -hmm. able to climb the ladder. And by the way, that, that ladder consisted of Dan McClellan Mm -hmm. and a lot of people know Rhino page. Even mm-hmm. though Rhino has not bowled the tour over the last two or three years. Mm-hmm. And then the next competitor I had was my good friend, Sean Rash. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I had to bowl this guy for the title. Uh, well, at the time, maybe he didn't have any majors, but God knows he's got a boatload of them now. Jason Belmonte. I don't even know who that is. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, of course I know who that is. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was a great tournament. And, um, you know, I mean, you did, that was awesome. I, I will say, I wasn't a fan of their production of that telecast because they went to commercial like three and a half frames. And then they, they, I know it was taped, but they, they skipped a few frames, uh, and whatnot. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was a great, uh, that was definitely a, uh, a great moment for you. And, uh, did you think that you won majors too early or, or too late? Or were you, uh, you know, cause I know that your first one was in 2001 and, um, you know, and how frustrating was it to not win a major until 2001? Eh, it's just part of life. It's, uh, you know, I, I believe everything in life happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you, you know, I don't know if you know this one or not, but in my lifetime, I've been very fortunate to win three majors, but I mm-hmm. finished second eight different times in majors. I do know that. Yep. Okay. I finished second at the U.S. Open one year. Mm-hmm. I finished second at the Tournament of Champions. I finished second twice at the Masters Mm -hmm. before I won, okay? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. then I finished second four different times at the Touring Players Championship, once again, before I won it, okay? So, you know, I don't want to say it plays on you, but I look at it, I want to win every tournament I bowl, regardless of the significance. But when you walk off the lanes in a major and you finish bridesmaid or second again, Mm -hmm. you go, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. I just let another one. And, and when I say let another one slip through my hands, it wasn't mm-hmm. like I let him slip through my hands. Some of them mm-hmm. I bowled 230 or 240 in the title match, but unfortunately it wasn't enough. Right. So what was your worst moment on tour? Oh boy. My worst moment on tour. Uh, funny moment or, or are we talking no, just, just like, you know, you ever bowl a tournament and you're like, just, you know, a, or either my heart's not into it, or I, I feel this is torture. And I just, you know, these games are, I'm, I'm not even close to making a cut. I just want this tournament to be over. I mean, just anything, anything. I know, I know a story about Jason couch and, uh, 
uh, you at uh, what AC Delco and what is it 97 or whatever uh, I, that that seems to be a funny moment but like just I mean you're a nice guy <laughs> I, know that one. I know that one yeah I get to that in a minute but uh yeah it, it, probably the worst moment I would say that I had on a tour uh, because I thought I had control of everything mm -hmm. I was in fifth place in Merritt Island Florida okay I'm getting ready to start the third round of match play. And I'm looking forward to another good night. I'm already in fifth. And hopefully if I bowl good tonight, I can climb up a couple spots for the TV show that's going to be live the following day. I'm bowling Brian Voss the first game. And I go out there and we get at that moment in time, we had five shots in practice on each of our starting lanes. So I strike most of my shots. And then I shoot a seven pin because I always make sure that I'm comfortable shooting a spare going cross lane. And keep in mind, folks, Brian Voss is 16 and 0 at this point. So he's looking to set a PBA record uh, of possibly going. If, I think if he wins six more matches, nobody's ever been 22 and 2 before out on tour, but he's already 16 and 0 under his belt. So I'm like, there is no way he's going to be 17 and 0 when we get done. Mm -hmm. Well, Derek, when I tell you this, I got up in the 10th. I did not miss a spare the whole game. Mm -hmm. It was nothing but splits and catastrophe. Mm -hmm. I left a seven pin on my fill ball or it's left a seven pin, a first shot in a 10th made the spare struck on my fill ball for one fourteen. You my shot lowest 14. team I ever bowled on tour at that moment in time. Needless to say, I grabbed my bowling balls, grabbed my sheet, filled it out and realized that I had to put minus 86 for that game. Yes. Brian boss did win the game pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, he moved on. I was no longer in fifth place. And to be quite honest, was not quite thinking about making the show at that point. I had to figure out how to save grace for or face for myself. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, you're like a really nice guy on tour. And I kind of a question off the sheet here. If you shoot 114 um, and somebody, let's just say uh, somebody just sees you come off the lanes. Hey, Parker, can I have your autograph? Are you giving them your autograph right then? Or you say, hey, listen, buddy, I just need 10 minutes or whatever. You want, you know, what, I mean, when I guess when is the right or wrong time to ask even the nicest guy on tour for his autograph? Derek, my wife will be the first to tell you because I've said this forever. What happens on the lanes stays on the lanes. Mm -hmm. When I walk off the lanes in less than five minutes, mm -hmm. I am not kidding you. If I was asked for an autograph at that moment in time, I may not personally be extremely happy about it, but I'm not going to turn that individual down. I'm going to take care of that autograph because they had nothing to do with my 114. That was all on me and me only. I'm going to take care of that. Hopefully they're going to smile. I'm going to walk away. By the way, did you tell Tom Doherty this story? Because I think he has a, I think he has one for you as well about 2011, you know, the, the 100, you know, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, That's but so. you know what? He can really laugh about that because mm -hmm. I told him when that happened, I was actually there that day. That was mm -hmm. obviously pretty funny. Mm -hmm. But uh, you tell me anybody that you know, because I don't know anybody else in the bowling world that has gotten paid $50,000 to bowl a 100 game. Okay. So you can laugh all you want at Tom Darty, folks, but that man got paid 50 grand that day to go out there and make a fool of himself that he wasn't trying to do that. Okay, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think to Tom Darty's defense, he mm -hmm. made the best of it. He didn't yeah, make a fool sure of did. himself. He was laughing because what else can you do at that moment? Well, yeah, what else? Yeah, what else can you do? Right? You know. Yeah. So, what ball era? And I'm not trying to age you, but I know that the ball eras were. I think it was rubber, and then it was uh, earth. Uh, no rubber, and then. Uh, plastic then urethane and then of course resin what ball era was the most challenging for you okay now now just wait a minute derek mm. i know i'm getting old but i'm not that old that i started on tour with rubber bowling balls okay? i didn't think you did i am All so right. sorry now now because some of your if jason couch was listening right now he would say oh he most certainly did start when there were rubber bowling balls okay but uh <laughs> You know, for me, I went out on tour in 85 and urethane balls were obviously the big thing out on tour. 
I, I thought that I had a, a pretty good thing going with urethane bowling balls, obviously, but there was a lot I had to learn. I'm, I'm the kid that's wet behind the ears. Mm. But when reactive resin came out, I had plenty of speed in my game. And I, mm. still to this day, I use my legs to create my power going up to the foul line. I mm. don't create the power with my wrist like some of the young guns do, and especially mm. the two-handers. Mm. But when reactive resin came out, realistically, nobody knew exactly what to do with these bowling balls. And everybody's guessing. All they know is they can create more power. So right. for me, it was eye-opening, eye-catching, and I was able to grab it and run with it. We all know that Walter Ray grabbed it and ran with it because he accomplished things that most people don't even possibly dream of. Mm -hmm. But to anybody's defense, regardless of what ball you throw, if you throw a marble down the lane correctly, it's going to knock them all over. But reactive resin certainly changed and enhanced our game in the scoring department. Okay. So the reason I, now I know you're busting my chops and that's okay. The reason <laughs> I put that question out there was because I had no idea, like, cause you started in the early eighties. Uh, the first time I will say this, the first time I ever saw you bowl was in 1991, in the celebrity Denver open. There was a telecast. It was uh, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, let's see. Curtis Odom was on that show. Mike, Mike, uh, or excuse me, Brian Goble, John Maza, and Mike Shady. And John Maza, I believe, won. Won, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you, he beat you for the title. Sorry, man. Um, yeah. But but uh, was, so I didn't know when the rubber, I guess, stopped. I guess, was that was that in the 50s? When did the rubber era end, do you know? Uh, I'd say the rubber era ended probably when soft rubber and mm -hmm. soft plastic came out, probably in the early to mid-70s. Okay. That would have been, you know, I think the big thing that back then would have been the Columbia Yellow Dot sure. and Johnny Petraglia LT48. Those sure. two balls probably changed the tour back then for, let me say, the vast majority of a decade until urethane came out in 1980. Okay. So, so when, what was your rookie year on tour? Uh, my rookie year on tour was 85. Okay. So that's when everything was urethane and that was, yes. okay. Okay. Yeah. Urethane, it would have been urethane. Uh, yellow dots were still out then. I will mm -hmm. be the first to admit that, uh, you know, but urethane uh, was the forefront soft plastic, like the yellow dot would have been there. Obviously plastic bowling balls. There mm -hmm. were not too many hard rubber balls going down a lane. LT 48 would have still been a, a ball then. Uh, but, but urethane was definitely taking the forefront. Okay. So, and the other question was, what was the ball era that uh, made you say, okay, finally it's here. I'm going to start winning. And this is where my hall of fame credentials will come. Um, I, I assume I know what the answer is. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but was that the resin era or, uh, or, uh, or what was, what was your, I guess, what was your favorite Ball. Well, it, it, it turns out to be the resin error. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know that that was coming. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody foreseen that coming. I'm out there, I'm bowling on the PBA tour, and I felt like every year I was continuing to get better. Um, okay. You know, my first TV show started for me in, in February of 87, mm -hmm. and I'm using a regular urethane ball. And I bowled for the title. Unfortunately, I lost to John Gant. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to take anything away from John. He's obviously a good friend of mine, and he doesn't live too far south of you. He lives right there in the Boston area. Oh, but, okay, yeah. But when I say that, uh, we only had regular urethane balls then. And then mm -hmm. the following year, I made a couple of TV shows. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, I did win my first title two months after I made that first show or three months after that in June. Um, but then I had made a couple of more shows not winning in 88, but then in 89, I won my second title, the Brunswick Memorial World Open in Chicago, Illinois. I was not even on the Brunswick staff at that point. Uh, it, or starting 89 is when I signed up for the Brunswick staff. But that was still regular urethane bowling balls. Mm -hmm. And then 1990 rolled along. I won my first title in or a third title in the early part of 1990, once again, using a urethane bowling ball. And then we went to the tournament champions and lo and behold, 
this ball named the Excalibur came out. Well, let me tell you, that opened up everybody's eyes because that ball hooked this much down the lane and everybody else could only hook the ball that much down the lane. And the power possessed, well, it, it certainly changed bowling. It changed bowling just like all the er other eras. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to look at. So bowlers in the 60s used hard rubber bowling balls. Bowlers in the 70s used soft rubber and soft plastic. Bowlers in the 80s used urethane. Bowlers mm -hmm. in the 90s used reactive resin. In the 2000s, it was proactive, a little bit reactive resin. And things have gone forthright from there. Uh, you know, what's going to come out in the, the 2020s? Uh, we don't know that answer, but I can tell mm -hmm. you right now that there's a lot of people working behind the scenes for any ball company to all of a sudden put their name on something that once again is going to revolutionize the sport. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you this. The first title I ever saw you win was the uh, 92 El Paso Open. Ah, At, yes. Uh, El Paso. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see what ball era. Okay, so I I feel like I know the answer to this. Favorite oil pattern? <laughs> How about if I tell you the one I strike on the most? Okay, of course. Uh, okay, okay. Before uh, before you even continue, I have to say this, ladies and gentlemen. If you ever meet Parker Bone and you're bowling a clinic with him. And you throw a shot and you're like, Parker, how come that didn't, how come uh, that didn't strike? He's going to tell you what Parker what? better throw a little bit better. No, you're going to say, well, you didn't hit the pin. What, what, if I say, oh, I left a six pin. How come I, how come it didn't fall? Well, you didn't hit it. Got to make a better shot. You got to hit it. That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. But All I right. Mean, you know, everybody thinks that I'd say that cheetah really favors me. Mm -hmm. uh, one, because I like to throw it firm or I like to throw it hard. I grew up playing the edge of the lane right out near the gutter. I have mm -hmm. no problem playing the edge. And, mm -hmm. and Derek, I have bowled complete tournaments where I'm playing one, two, three, the entire tournament and not throwing it in the gutter. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing that irks me or gets under my skin, if I'm playing the edge and I throw it in the gutter, that gets me more aggravated than missing a one pin spare. Sure. Just because you're throwing a lot of senseless pins away, but mm -hmm. I don't really care about the pattern that we bowl on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pattern doesn't matter to me. All mm -hmm. I ask, and I got to believe that from my heart, once again, I'm going to speak as a PBA player. Mm -hmm. We just ask to, for it to be fair for everybody involved. Okay. Right-handed or left-handed. We are all a product of the game or mm -hmm. the sport. We don't do the lanes. We are competitors that are going out there trying to do the best we can. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now that I've had tournaments that I've prevailed by more than 10 pins a game just because I've been lined up properly and I've been figured out how to, to let me say, figure out a way to really run over the field. Mm -hmm. And there have been events that I've bowled that I don't have any chance from ball one just by watching ball reaction. Let me go with my own opposed to guys on the other side of the lane, mm -hmm. but we don't do them. So all we are, are competitors in the field, but I think as a player, we all just want the fairest thing for everybody regardless. And I'm going to say, we just got done bowling the U S open on 49 feet. I thought that that was pretty fair for everybody. Okay. So I'm going to, so I want to throw this out there because I have a, I have a memory, uh, you know, I have a pretty good memory, I guess. Um, I remember the 2002 battle at little Creek, uh, mm -hmm. you, you won that. It was basically more or less on cheetah before it was cheetah. There was pattern E than cheetah, whatever. Um, you shot 279 in the title match there. The very next tournament was six months later in October in Wichita, same pattern, 35 feet. What was the difference? How come no cash in that tournament? And, uh, was it because the, it was at Wichita, it was the, was the lane surface, the problem, or was it just, you just didn't match up on that pattern? It, it honestly, I'll take own ownership to it. Maybe it was the player. I honestly don't remember what happened. Uh, you know, keep in mind, <laughs> Derek, that, that's about 22 or 23 years I ago, my friend. Uh, I understand. You know, but when we say that, it, you can put the same exact pattern mm -hmm. from bowling center A and go five minutes down the road to bowling center B, mm -hmm. put the same exact pattern and get a completely different result. Mm. Just because characteristics of that bowling center don't fit the pattern or do the pattern justice when you put it down on the lanes. 
Some mm-hmm. facilities, regardless of pattern, believe it or not, will hook off the gutter. It could be friction. It could be the fact of the lane. Maybe the lane is dished a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, meaning that the, the lane actually goes down in the center of the lane, not by the naked eye, mm-hmm. but just because there's depressions in the lane. And then if you put that same pattern at the bowling center down the street, that the gutters are pretty tight or the lane surface is pretty tight or the lane is crowned. When I say crowned, now instead of it being dished where it's down, mm-hmm. now the center part of the lane is actually up just a fraction, a couple thousandths, hundred thousandths of an inch. Mm-hmm. But it makes a world of a difference. Therefore, your ball is coming uphill instead of going downhill. Okay. So favor somebody, it doesn't favor somebody else, but it's up to you as a player to take ownership and figure it out. Okay. So I guess the other question is um, – a kind of reversal of that. Now, before I ask it, um, so your favorite, your least favorite oil pattern. Now, the reason I brought that, the reason I asked that is because I, I did think you had a favorite pattern that you, you know, your answers definitely make sense. Uh, I guess Dave Traber, uh, you know, he, when, uh, he hated the shark pattern or pattern B because he had to hook it. And the Dave Traber's a guy that throws it very hard straight. He shoots 300 on, on his toughest on an oil pattern he hates in a tournament. I can't remember exactly which one it was. Um, but uh, do, do you have an oil pattern that if you'd be okay to never see again? Well, the longer the pattern, it's always been a little more challenging for me. Okay. You know, I mean, we just bowled on a 49 foot pattern at the U S open and obviously that was my lowest block. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a guy that likes to throw it firm. And like I just alluded to a minute ago, I don't have the hand like a lot of these young guns uh, or young professionals have. I certainly mm-hmm. don't have two hands on the ball. But if my rev rate is approximately 325 or 330 mm-hmm. and you look at somebody with a four or five or even 600 rev rate, well, their ball is going to pick up on the lane and change direction much stronger than mine will. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you look at that, the longer the pattern at that point, if they figure out how to bowl, and I'm going to say that because just because they have a big rev rate doesn't mean that they sincerely know how to bowl at that point. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a big rev rate and you can keep things under control, that pattern is going to favor them a pinch more than it'll favor Parker Bone. Okay. So we're going to do one more question and then we're going to take a a, a, a brief we're going to look at the uh, answer some questions in the chat uh, because after this next question we'll be halfway through the regular questions before we actually go flush in the pocket your toughest opponent and why I feel my toughest opponent was Mike Albee okay uh, you know I, I I look at at the man the man the myth the legend uh, you, you know Mike is a sincere friend, friend of mine I seen him quite a few times last week uh, we get along wonderful together But when you bowled Mike Albee, I feel like if I didn't physically shut him out, when he got up in the 10th frame, if he needed three in the the 10th to beat me by a pin, I could start penciling in the victory for Mike. And all I was was a fan just sitting there watching. Mm -hmm. He always had my number. It seemed like he had the best of me at that point. But uh, it's funny when you say this, because I'm going to turn this question and roll it into another adventure here, Mm -hmm. that... Mike Albee had my number. Jason Couch had Mike Albee's number, but I had Jason Couch's number. So it was a it was a perfect triangle when you looked at it there, the way that it all fell out. And it didn't mean that any one of us couldn't win or become victorious over the other guy. But if you look at the three of us and you look at the numbers that we produce, you will find out that each one of us was probably 80 percent over top of the other guy. Mm-hmm. And why it fell out that way, my friend, I have no idea. Well, I will say this, uh, and, and this is going to sound stupid to a lot of people, but this is my show. I say whatever I want. You had my number on Brunswick Circuit Pro Bowling for PlayStation, okay? Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was just, I just couldn't beat you, man. It was just awful. Um, but anyway, so sorry, everybody. Um, okay, so we got a couple in the chat. So there's a there's a guy that is, uh, who's become a good friend of mine, the bowler. He's got a YouTube you know, his own YouTube channel and he streams, uh, different video games, um, uh, PBA pro bowling, 23, 21 and the original. So he says, uh, Hey Derek, Hey PB three. This is very cool that you're interviewing someone that I've admired since 
the eighties when I started watching ABC. Uh, and then he also says, I have a question, Parker. Oh, let's bring it here. Um, and uh, can you see that? Uh, yeah. So I guess what's your answer to that question? What has been the best secret to your longevity and your timeless style with the famous knee bend? Uh, yeah, I think part of that is just genetics. Fortunately for me, uh, and I'm going to knock on wood when I say that, uh, I've always had a pretty deep knee bend and it's not as deep now. I'm going to tell everybody it's not as deep now as it used to be. But that's because my my knee, my right knee occasionally, I don't want to say gives out, but it, it gets the best of me from time to time, especially if we bowl somewhere where the approaches are a little bit tacky. OK, so I think that my style doesn't put a lot of wear, wear and tear on my body. It's pretty easy on my body. And although I feel like I'm aggressive at the follow through and poignant at the point of release, I don't obviously create the power that, let me say, somebody like Jason Couch did, uh, the power that maybe EJ Tackett or, for that matter, even Jason Belmonte. You know, these are our modern day players, regardless of what, how many hands they use. Uh, the torque that they put on their body, we don't know when that's going to give way for a player like Belmo or a player like Tackett. But we certainly know that wear and tear, at least I know what it's done to my good friend, Jason. Uh, he just actually had a knee replacement here uh, mm -hmm. about two months ago now. He's been through a lot of rehabilitation and uh, he's actually starting uh, full fledged. He's got a couple of miles a day, he does on a bicycle, but he's going to start to hit the lanes here sometime real soon. So let me ask you this uh, kind of a kind of a BS question, I guess. I mean, it seems like it seems like Jason's having his knee operated on as, you know, as often as you eat uh, chocolate chip cookie or uh, mint cho chocolate chip ice cream. But I mean, what what have you? First off, have you ever had your knee operated on? Have I? No, I've never had my knee operated on. So uh, why why has he? Is it because of that? It, it, it's not his 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 right knee, is it? Is it is yes, it's his right knee. The the one the when he kicks right when he when he releases the ball. No, he gets down at the foul line when he gets down, okay. just like I do. We both okay. finish on our right leg, but for him, the torque that okay. he has possessed when he okay. goes to follow through there. Everything, all of that, let me say, strength that you have is coming down on your finishing leg. Mm -hmm. And both of us are the same. But mine is a much easier, let me say, flowing way where his is down and he's pulling it or, well, what appears to be pulling it, where he's solid at the foul line, but everything comes right down there to the foul line, down solid at the ground. So okay. I think that you know, his body hasn't been able to withstand the test of time. Whereas maybe we're built the same. Maybe the torque took part of his body away. And then again, let's go back to genetics. Why was Jason built where he has to go through that opposed to where I don't have to. So I just think it's just knock on wood, luck of the draw, buddy. I do want to say this and no disrespect to any other pro bowler, but if I could only watch two pro bowlers forever in my life, uh, only two would be definitely be you and Jason couch uh, meeting, you know, sp you know, I've gotten, I've bought Jason a couple beverages in Florida when I, when I'd see him in, uh, at, don't buy uh, his beverage, make him buy yours. No way. That no way, man. Brat. No, no, uh, it is, it is an honor to buy. And it is an honor because he is, uh, I, first off, I, we're not as close as you and I are. And I, I kind of hopefully, hopefully we could change that, but, uh, yeah, so uh, Gary, or excuse me, the bowler says this as well. He bowled with Dan McCullen in uh, uh, Montreal Open. Uh, so that's, yeah, so that's cool. You know, it, it, Dan, McCle Dan McClellan was a super great guy. Why he eliminated the tour, uh, meaning, you know, being part of his ritual, mm -hmm. things change for everybody. I don't know his story. I don't know why he doesn't bowl on the tour anymore, but mm. I'm going to tell you right now, if you had an opportunity to meet Danny, I have, you had a chance to actually bowl with him. We're talking about a wonderful human being that mm. did nothing but good for the sport of bowling. And I'm just going to hope that at the present day, wherever he's at, I hope he's safe. I hope he's healthy. And mm. I hope that he's enjoying life and, and shedding some of those smiles with other people around him. So a quick story about Dan. Uh, the first year the PBA came to Portland, 
Um, he, I think uh, what on Saturday he sees me and says, Hey, um, you know, come see me tomorrow before you leave. I, I might have a ball for you. I know you're not, a, I know it's not a Brunswick ball. Um, but, uh, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> when, you know, dad, my dad would, uh, my dad would bring me to Portland and, uh, he, you know, he's not a bowler. He's just a good dad. So we would get out of there way before the, the tournament would be over. So at around two o'clock we'd go and, uh, Danny was done bowling and he's, he gave me a ball that is now cracked. It's on my windowsill in, in Maine, but, uh, everybody, I think Patrick Allen signed that and, uh, you know, his whole team signed that for me and I will never forget Dan McClellan and I will definitely be saying hello to him very soon. And I would definitely love to talk to him as well. And, uh, so the final comment before we continue with the questions, uh, I really appreciate your time, the, you know, doing this, by the way, uh, we are chatting with the great Parker bone, the third, um, I've, I should have, uh, I should have, uh, hit the block button for this one, but, uh, Andrew Pfeffer says, uh, congratulations on the U S open, uh, <laughs> you know. yeah, open and, and ahead of my kids. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't you have to hit a block button there at all. I, I can tell you right now, it was it's all bragging rights back at the house. Yeah. You know, um, I, I wanted a, I say this, I wanted nothing but the best for my kids. The same as Chris Barnes wants for his son or Wes Malott wanted for his son. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that all of our kids are exceptional players, but we also know that they all have to learn, mm -hmm. you know? And when you look at the struggles that any one of our our kids had on the lanes, or let me say some of the younger guns that came out there to bowl that week, that mm -hmm. as much as they're prepared, they're not really prepared for the U.S. Open until they actually bowl on it. OK, no. uh, the struggles that they all went through, you, you know, my kids were beating me the first round. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And, and uh, you know, I know when it was done, I just looked at him and I said, chopping a couple of spares uh, that got the best of me. I couldn't figure out how to stop doing that until I actually changed bowling ball a certain way that I shot the spares. Um, but when I say that as the tournament unfolded, I had a really great block, the last block almost mm -hmm. my block of the day, mm -hmm. like I alluded to a minute ago. But the one thing that I'm going to tell you, and I try to get this point across to my kids, believe it or not, Derek, let's put splits aside. Splits are splits. Uh, normal two-pin combinations. I hooked by the 3-9. Mm -hmm. I didn't make that. And I chopped a 6-9. They mm -hmm. were the only two spares, two-pin combinations that I missed all week in 24 mm -hmm. games, mm -hmm. single pin spares. I did not miss a single pin spare the entire tournament, except for a fill ball when I changed balls because I didn't want to shoot what was on the deck. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. when I look at that, the spares alone is what got me to wh finish where I did. And I looked at my own kids because Justin finished about 40 or 50 behind me. Mm -hmm. Spares alone cost him a check. I will tell you that. And spares, although we don't have all the numbers in front of us, I would say ultimately if he makes most of his spares, let me go 90 or 95% of his spares because nobody's going to make 100%. Mm. But I'm talking to cluster spares. I'm talking about multiple pin combinations, two and three and four pins that are standing at the end. If he makes his spares, believe it or not, he makes the top 24. Yeah. Okay. So he knows where to fix his game. He knows where to work at it. Mm. And it, it's not embarrassment because I, all of our kids, you know, I include Wes and I include Chris in this too. All of our kids weren't embarrassed with their finish. They just have to learn what is it that they need to work on to try to strive to get better. Right. Right. So thanks Fef, for asking that. I appreciate it. No, of course. And, and it was just, um, you know, and I think, man, I gotta, I gotta pause, you know, I get that I'm a fan. I get that we're friends, but I gotta say, I, you know, it just boggles my mind that Justin is where he is right now because one thing that always sticks in my head is when you won in Park um, Spartanburg, 07, mm -hmm. uh, you just beat Patrick Allen. You're ready to bowl Rhino Page. You go in the crowd and you say, one more game, you're going to clap with Pepe. And I'm a, I'm a, I didn't know you had any French in you. We're, we're French. And um, I thought, and I'm just like, wow, man. That was on, of course, uh, December 16 of 07. I, just, I couldn't believe that uh, 
Uh, God, I mean, you got that name, man, that date what? just like right like that. It's right in your hand. Listen, man. Hey, listen, I watch, you know, I, when uh, when I was on your when I was on Justin's show with Mike uh, and he was asking me, how do you know all this stuff? I I I answered it the wrong. I watch. I watch tournaments like I just today. I actually watched your Columbia 300 and your uh, track, your Canadagua win. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I just, I don't know. I remember dates, you know, where people have weaknesses. Uh, they also have strengths and for some reason, numbers and dates. I mean, you love the 16th of the month. Let's look. Can we look at this for a second? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, 1993, uh, you beat, uh, Ron, Will uh, not Ron Williams, but Amleto Monticelli 268 to 257 on the 16th of the month. Uh, you did that in, uh, uh South Carolina. And then of course you win El Paso in 05 on the 16th of on January 16th, beating Robert Smith. I mean, I don't know. It's just, you love the 16th of the month, apparently. Uh, but well, maybe uh, we are, hey, well, every listen. TV show on the 16th of the month. I exactly, exactly. So, uh, all right. So let's see the, I think I know the answer to this, but, uh, easiest opponent. Easiest opponent. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know what? I, I'm going to say easiest opponent. We Laugh. haven't bowled together, so it's not me yet. No, no. Uh, <laughs> one of the easier opponents it seemed to be Marshall Holman. Okay? And and I love Marshall. I really mm -hmm. do. But mm -hmm. I was caught up in Marshall and what he would be like being Marshall on the lanes. Okay? Mm -hmm. And Marshall, he didn't do it to me. He just did it in general when he would walk back, let me say, and just give it the big wave with his hands like he's done with that shot or whatever happened, whether he struck or didn't strike. Mm -hmm. So about the third or fourth time I bowled Marshall, Marshall in match play, I walked off the lanes and I had that little strut where I tried to put my elbows out and just walk off in a way that, you know, like Marshall would mm -hmm. just having a little fun with him. Mm -hmm. Well, little did I know, maybe that affected him. And the next thing you know, I find myself, it seems like a little bit more so than not beating Marshall. And I'm like, I think I'm beating Marshall just because I'm actually beating him getting into his head instead of allowing him to get into mine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when I say that, I consider Marshall a great friend of mine too. Sure. But everybody out on tour has their own mind games that they play. Okay. Because there, there's no duking it out. We're not punching each other. We're allowing our bowling ball to do all the talking for us. But the fans in the back, they want to see a show. They don't want to just watch you throw a shot, sit down on a chair like a clone. Okay? So I'm going to try to have a little bit more fun. I wouldn't walk off the lanes like that if I'm bowling anybody else. But I did it with Marshall because I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, as it was. I think it turned out to be a little bit more in my benefit. But once again, I've got nothing but full respect for the great Marshall Holman. Love Marshall Holman. He's a he's a great uh he's a great guy, definitely. Um PBA rule that hold on PBA rule you agree with, you agreed with. I mean, I know the PBA has a whole bunch of rules, but Yeah, there... we do have a bunch of rules. Uh PBA rule that I agree with. I, I think one rule that I agree with wholeheartedly, and I don't think we stick to it enough, mm -hmm. is a dress code. Okay. okay? And occasionally, I'm going to say, once again, I, I kind of shy away from it. But I only shy away from it because everybody and their brother gets away with doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should ever walk into a bowling center without being fully dressed up in a nice pair of slacks and a nice shirt. Doesn't have to be a bowling shirt. OK, I don't care if it's a Nike shirt. I don't care if it's an incidental shirt. It, mm. I'm not asking you to come in suit and a tie. All mm. right. I'm not looking for you to spend five hundred dollars now, but I'm asking you to look like the true professional that you need to be. When you look at basketball and you watch those athletes walk on and off before they're in their game gear, mm. they are dressed to the hill. Mm -hmm. All right. Football players are the same way. You don't typically watch these guys walking on and off the planes in sweatpants, ripped jeans, holy T-shirts. Okay, they might have a hat on. Mm -hmm. I'll give them that. 
You want to wear a hat in the bowling center? I think you should be able to just because uh, the hat fits you well. Or, or maybe, you know, Derek, I'm looking at you. You don't have any hair on the top of your head. Maybe the hat keeps your head warm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to respect that. Yeah. But I think the players that come in undressed, uh, we want to we want to bowl for more money. Well, you should act like you want to bowl for more money, not come in dressed mm. like a bum. I do want to say I, I apologize for coming into uh, those mini camps wearing jeans, and, but I did wear a bronze shirt different. with my name on the back. Okay, you're De Derek. You're not the trained professional that's bowling on TV, buddy. You are I get it. our fan. Okay, and as our fan. You should be able to walk in any way that you want to walk in. Mm. But if you're looking at me and I'm going mm. to single me out right now, I hope that I am that consummate professional. And when I walk into the vast majority of the places that I do walk mm. into that, I look like I'm a professional in the field. Yeah. I try to conduct myself that way. I mean, I know that I'll never get my card. So that's, you know, that's why I'm like, Oh, you know, that's why when I go to those mini camps, I always, make sure I wear my name on the back of my shirt. Every time I go to a pro event in Portland, I always wear my name on the back. I make sure I wear a Brunswick bowl of eye shirt. Uh, you know, yes, I bowl in shorts, but uh, that's just, that's just how I, that's just how I do it. Mm -hmm. you know? um, PBA rule. You hate it. Why, why the hell is this a rule? What? It doesn't even make sense. What PBA rule you hated. Uh, I think that one of the PBA rules that I hate that once again, we don't live up to. I love the rule if we abide by it is the guys putting the balls down on sheets. There's really nobody that uh, looks at that uh, as players. And let me just give you a prime example. I bowled with two other players this week, Kyle Troop and Bill O'Neill. Mm -hmm. Okay. And obviously myself being the third player on that pair, we write balls on the sheet. There is not one of us that's going to go check the other player's ball to make sure that their numbers are exactly what they're writing on the sheet. Now it is on me. I'm supposed to do that. Okay. The U S open was different. You had to put 10 up 10 balls on a ball card and they checked all the balls ahead of time. Mm -hmm. But the standard PBA event, I don't know hardly anybody. And there's the exception is going to be less than 5% that goes and checks another player's ball and ball to make sure that those numbers are exactly what they wrote down. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that would probably take precedence here more recently would be like with the purple hammers or maybe one or two other significant urethane balls mm -hmm. that guys are trying to make sure that these guys are abiding by the rule, but they're mm -hmm. not checking anything else. Can I be honest with you? I'm a Brunswick brand guy, as you know, but I'm so sick of seeing the purple hammer. I just want to see like the big, <laughs> the big ball like the big you know what's the newest resin ball that the you know they came out with i i just want i want to see it i'm purple hammer just doesn't do it for me um uh, box them over i'll tell you what god bless anybody using it yeah yeah absolutely now what was not a pba rule that should have been you know it's something i just brought up here um more recently uh of my own opinion you watch when I first came out on tour in 85, if you watched one player and I mean one in a given six game or eight game block, mm -hmm. stop at the foul line and balk. 10 guys would go over and ask the guy, Hey, you're, you okay? Is everything all right? Something wrong? Because mm -hmm. they were concerned. Now, with a lot of the, and I'm going to say it, I believe it started in college somewhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you watch these young guns come out on tour now. And so many of them balk at the foul line or stop at the foul line. And that catches another player. And when it catches another player, that player that they've caught cannot get that shot over. So mm -hmm. personally, I think we're allowed to re-racks a game. Personally, I think if you balk when your foot is past the end of the ball return, that should count as a re-rack. Okay? Okay. If okay. you stop before the end of the ball return, no harm, no foul. But it doesn't do anything, even at that point, for the player that you've caught. So I, I don't know how to fix that, but it definitely – and I watched it happen more than 10 or 20 times this week at the U.S. Open mm -hmm. where a player would balk at the foul line – and as soon as they do, it's going to catch somebody five or six lanes away because they're not expecting that motion. 
Can I, I I've done it. I've balked. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I have. Um, and I do too. It, you, you, I think it's a skill you need to learn. I totally understand. I think it's a sk- skill you need to learn. You need to learn how to pull out so that you don't get hurt. You don't hurt yourself. Um, so oh, I, I have no problem with somebody doing it, mm-hmm. but own up to it. If you mm-hmm. pull out, just know mm-hmm. it's going to count as one of your re-racks. Sure. Yep. Okay. You're allowed to a game, whether you do it balking or if you do it by hitting the reset button, that's up to you. Mm-hmm. So I have to congratulate you. This is hypothetical, of course. Uh, you are now the owner of the PBA. Parker Bone owns the PBA tour or the PBA <laughs> oh, God. for a year. I, I want to know that for a year. Okay. Or you can, you could do this any way you want. Mm-hmm. If you own the PBA tour, what are you doing with it? So the question reads like this. Congratulations, PB3. You now uh, own the PBA tour for one year. Hypothetically speaking, of course, what would you do if you owned the PBA? What would I do if I owned the money? PBA? Whatever. I mean, whatever. It's yours. Well, I mean, it, it'd be nice if all the bowling integers were on the same page. Um, I, I think that we're close in some regards but I still think we're still too far apart in other regards. And when I say bowling integers, I'm going to start with the PBA at the top and USBC uh, right alongside of them. Mm-hmm. They are the two main players in our sport. And, and it used to be ABC, WIBC, the men's mm-hmm. and the ladies. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, it has to start with the PBA, the best bowlers in the world. Mm-hmm. Right behind that is equivalent or close to it, the ladies. Mm-hmm. All right. The ladies need significance. Basically, our sport is made up half men, half ladies. And I'm not going to get here and say one's 51 percent, one's 49 percent. Mm-hmm. OK, but there's a lot of people on both sides of the fence that play our sport. And the ladies need to have their own way, shape or form to go out there and, and bowl for a living. Mm-hmm. Do they need to bowl for exactly how much the men are bowling for? I don't have that answer. I, I got to be quite honest. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at a lot of other sports, it appears that the men are in the forefront on most of those sports. And the ladies do take a little bit of the backstage. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, both sides of it deserve their, deserve their own professional aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And right behind those two, mm-hmm. I'm going to look at some sort of formulation of the senior tour and, and the regional tours. Uh, but to say that I own the tour, how am I going to change it? Derek, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that none of us know about. Mm-hmm. And the tour itself cannot survive without network television. Right. I'd love to see us have more network television. Mm-hmm. I think Fox is doing one hell of a, a deal with everything mm-hmm. that they've done with professional bowling over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to hope and cross my fingers not for me. I'm almost 60, buddy. Okay. Mm-hmm. But when I say that, I hope that it gets bigger and better for all of those younger guns that are not only out there now, but the ones behind them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very good. Very good. I, I, I like that. So in 2001, the uh, PBA went to sport bowling patterns. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, did you like that? And uh, were they too tough, too easy, just right? We've always been bowling on some sort of sport compliant bowling pattern. Uh, And the reason I say that, because when I first went out on tour in in 1985, uh, I could do whatever I wanted to at home. You know, it didn't matter Mm -hmm. if I was playing two, five, 10, 15, there was always friction left of my target. And there was always some sort of hold inside of my target. All right. Mm -hmm. When you go out on tour, that mountain in the middle of the lane, and I'm going to show you with my hands here, that mountain all of a sudden becomes parallel. All right. Mm -hmm. It gets Mm -hmm. stretched across the lane from left to right. Yes, it goes front to back. That's all dependent on the length of the pattern. We bowled Mm -hmm. on patterns back then that were 35 feet. We bowled on patterns that were 42 to 44 feet. All Mm -hmm. right. You didn't have to make a longer pattern because the balls weren't that strong then, but stronger balls came out. You had to lengthen oil patterns. You had to put more oil on the lane. So we, we've bowled on these patterns or variations of them in the 80s and the 90s. It just became more significant. And uh, when I say more significant, I'm going to actually 
go a little bit against the PBA in this one regards. In 2000 to 2010, there was much more promotion that went out there on bowling in the Cheetah, the Viper, the Scorpion, mm -hmm. the Shark, okay? That promotions should have went to the greatest players in the world. Your mm -hmm. top 10 or 20 stars that make the PBA Tour. Those patterns were not the superstar of the PBA Tour, and that's mm -hmm. what somebody tried to hold on to. Right. So uh, Brian Valenta was at my house back in 2016. Uh, he and his girlfriend at the time came to visit me. And so we, we were all talking and he said that the PBA made a big mistake by not making, not making Pete Weber kind of their poster of the, you know, not utilizing him like they should. But so I, I get, you know, cause they, cause you know, how every, everything like in the NBA, it's always LeBron James or uh, hockey. It's uh Sidney Crosby or whatever, but uh, they said something like uh, the PBA didn't uh, utilize Pete Weber the way they should. Uh, do you think there's a star that they should have utilized on tour that like, Hey, uh, this guy might be bowling or whatever, or, or I, I guess to kind of, who, who would you have made the star? I guess. Well, uh, every, <clears throat> every decade has its own era of stars. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let, let me go back to the 1960s. Obviously we know that it was Dick Weber. Mm -hmm. It was Don Carter. Uh, it, it may have been Ray Bluth. It might have been Carmen Salvino, you know. Uh, and then you, you look into the 70s, uh, you, Johnny Petraglia. By all means, in the mid to late 70s, it was uh, Earl Anthony, Mark Roth, and Marshall Holman. I don't care what show you <coughs> turn on. One of those three guys was going to be on the show. Mm -hmm. And as the PBA continued – they're the guys that you need to promote. Dave Davis may, you know, may rest in peace. He passed away a couple of a uh, couple of weeks ago. Now, uh, he would have been another one of your superstars back in the early seventies. In the eighties, it was Mike Albee. It was Walter Ray Williams came onto the scene. You know, uh, um, Leno Monticelli was two time player of the year in the late eighties. There, right around eighty nine ninety. Uh, I know that in nineteen ninety, that Walter Ray continued to dominate almost in every facet along with myself. Mike mm -hmm. Alby was, was still the, the one of the major players in the field there. You know, uh, Norm Duke obviously sincerely made the name for himself coming into the 90s, which mm -hmm. rolled along into the 2000s. Norm Duke was still the player. But then you got some of the newer guys or the younger guns. Tommy Jones made it, uh, put his foot out on the door. Sean Rash obviously mm -hmm. made, made a name for himself. Doug Kent mm -hmm. had that awesome banner year. And we're still promoting lane patterns. In mm. 2010, this unknown guy out of nowhere, what do you mean he can bowl two-handed? Who is he? Well, mm -hmm. look at the name he's made for himself. Jason Belmonte, mm -hmm. Chris Svensson, mm -hmm. you know, Anthony Simonson, obviously Kyle Troop. I mean, <laughs> if nothing else, the way he dresses and the hair he's got, my God, you could take and promote him all week long. Mm -hmm. So, so Yeah. There you go. That's, that's good to that, that. I mean, that's a great answer. So the last regular question, uh, and before we go flush in the pocket, uh, so back in 99, I went to the U S open to watch to my, it was my first ever pro event. And, um, <clears throat> I saw everybody had their name on the back of their shirts and I was, I don't know. I was, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. It's like taking a me seeing that was like taking your, your kids to Disney world. You know, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I know that in 2001, in the fall of 2001, the PBA started, you started having to wear your name on the back of your shirt on TV. Did right. you like that? Doesn't matter to me. Doesn't matter to totally, you. I, I'm totally fine with it. You know, uh, when you watch most other sports, mm -hmm. basketball, baseball, football, uh, any sport there, those mm -hmm. players on the field, I know they're playing for a team, but they've mm -hmm. got their name or a number on the back of their shirt. People mm -hmm. know who they are. Mm -hmm. Now, golf doesn't have it, and tennis doesn't have it, and bowling didn't have it up until that point. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, you start putting the, the names on the back of the shirt. I just think it gave the player a little bit more significance or notoriety that people knew. It wasn't just that they were watching Parker Bone. They mm -hmm. got to see his name on the back of a shirt, and maybe they, they said it once or twice or three or four times to themselves. And hopefully that name resonated with the player that they were watching. As mm -hmm. with all of the other players that are out there now, 
you know, the shirts have gotten exponentially nicer. Mm. The apparel has really taken off. Mm. So now you can show a little bit more character by putting your name on the back of your shirt. It's not like it's got to be one inch or two inch block letters. So it didn't bother is, me. Is your name your signature? It is. It is. Okay. I got to say my favorite shirt that I've ever seen. Listen, I, I, want to, I want to let you know, I do get out. I do have a life outside of this, but, uh, the, uh, my favorite, I think my favorite shirts I saw you wear were, uh, 98 Japan cup, 99 Japan cup. It was just straight up Parker bone. The third, I think it looked a lot nicer when it was just print. Hey, you know, there it is. But I mean, your mm -hmm. signature is great, obviously, but, um, yeah. So, so, so you didn't mind that at all. Nope. Not at all. Cool. Cool. And do you, so, 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 you know, so you don't mind. So I guess the last question is, you don't mind, you don't, do you like wearing your name? You don't, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to you. It doesn't bother me. I mean, I'm not going to walk down the street with my name shirt on. Gotcha. You know, if, if I got them all in a squad, maybe I got a jacket over top of me. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, it's not like I'm going to take and, and leave the playing field, leaving it on, you know, morning, noon, and night. I'm going to put a plain shirt on and whether it's a bowling shirt, regardless one sure. way or the other. Right. So, so, okay. When was last, so when was the last time you bowled 300? When was the last time I bowled 300? Oh boy. Mm -hmm. now, now you're going to age me a tiny bit here. I'm going to say it would have had to be in sometime last year. Let's go on a limb and say probably in the summer on the senior tour. Now that's probably challenging to bowl 300. You know, I mean, sometimes you get you have, to bowl 12 strikes in a row. You have to have a few breaks, right? You so, always need a couple of breaks. Right. So you're going to bowl 300 tonight and it's going to be the easiest 300 you ever throw because you just need your voice. So the, oh the, fine, the, the segment we do, uh, the segment I wanted to do was because this is called Flush in the Pocket podcast. Uh, I wanted to come up with, uh, you know, at the end, 12 questions, 12 strikes. 300 you know there are no ringing seven pins no whatever these are just fun stuff a lot of these some of these are not related to bowling some of them are but uh let's go you ready i'm ready all i right. believe in flush in the pocket that's the only way all right so favorite music favorite music i like a uh i'll say rock it doesn't have to be heavy rock i'm mm -hmm. not into the heavy metal stuff uh you know and, and traditionally I would say 70s and 80s because that's the era, once again, that I grew up with listening. But a, a modern day rock is okay too. I just don't need it to where it's it's head banging. Okay. Do you go to concerts? Number two. I've only been to one concert. Uh, I went to a Bruce, Bruce Springsteen concert, coincidentally, in Newark a long, long time ago with my wife. Uh, I'm not the big concert goer, uh, but my wife enjoys them all the time when she can. Oh, see, I, I've probably been to close to a hundred. I, that's all oh I do. God. That's all I spend my money on. Maybe. <laughs> uh, so, so real quick. So when my dad, when, when I was with, when we first moved to Hamden, Maine, he took me to see Kenny Rogers back in, I don't know, I must've been seven or eight years old. And he, it was, I had no idea what a concert was. I had no idea, you know, are we going to be able to meet him? So my mother made brownies. So I was sitting in my chair and I was holding up a brownie just like this or whatever. And I'm just like, I said, I, I'm thinking he's going to see me. I don't know. I'm dumb as a stick kid. So, uh, you know, but yeah, uh, that kind of, I go to concerts all the time. That's, that's all right. Spend my you know, some people really love him. I, I'm going to tell you right now that, uh, my wife sincerely loves going to concerts, especially country music ones. And, and someday I am going to go to a country music concert with her because I, I do like country music, but uh, I'd say I'm more of a, a modern or mellow rock guy. Good for you. Good for you. So number three, favorite place you've traveled for bowling outside of the United States? Uh, I've always had a lot of success in Japan. I love Japan. Um, my entire life, if I add up all the time frame that I've been there, I probably have been to Japan well over a year of my lifetime. But Japanese people, Derek, I, I'm going to say this. I just made this statement just about two hours ago uh, back at the bowling center where we're bowling here. Mm -hmm. Japanese people treat us twice as nice as we treat our own friends. So I consider you my good friend, my honestly, I would do anything in the world for you there, man. Please understand that. Uh, but, but 
Japanese people will treat you that exact way and even better, mm -hmm. even though they don't know you. That's their culture. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just fun fact, you you to the Japan Cup is what Pete Weber is to the U.S. Open. You've won the Japan Cup uh, four times, I think. Mm -hmm. Pete Weber's won it five. We won the uh, U.S. Open five. So, I mean, you're the best. As far as I know, you're the best uh, Japan Cup bowler in PBA history. So, Well, maybe I'm a fortunate guy. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, so, favorite place outside of the United States uh, for relaxation? That would have to be any beach that I can go to with my wife without mm -hmm. a bowling ball in my hand. Uh, we actually just spent about two weeks ago. We went to Aruba for five days. First time I've ever been there. Uh, and, and I mean it from my heart. I will go back there again. That was absolutely exquisite. Um, nothing but beauty in front of you and mm -hmm. relaxation. And actually, I, the furthermore, I felt very safe there. Uh, you didn't mm -hmm. have to overlook your shoulder. Another place that I would call, though, for a different reason, uh, the country of Switzerland. It lives mm -hmm. up to its expectations. It is by far one of the prettiest places I have ever seen in this world. And, and folks, I've been to a lot of different places, a lot of different countries, and been very fortunate to see a lot of things. But that place, wow, does it stick out. Woo. So what do you do to completely take your mind off of bowling? Uh, believe it or not, I enjoy working around my house. People mm -hmm. don't understand that, but uh, I have no problem grabbing a rake, grabbing a chainsaw, working mm -hmm. outside in my yard, uh, maybe doing something in my house, whether it's painting or fixing something up, uh, just because it's a break away from the things that we do all the time, all year round. So, mm -hmm. and when you're done, I can look at my own facility, meaning my household, inside or out, mm -hmm. and go, that really looks nice. And I'm glad that I did that today. Okay. Do you think if you gave Jason Couch a chainsaw, do you think he'd chase you around the house with it or something? I mean, you wouldn't even know what to do with it. <laughs> okay. I love it. I love it. Please. Driver or hammer. I'll give him that one. He's probably going to look at you and go, Oh, hammer. Yeah. That's a bowling ball. I throw it down. No, Jason, we're not talking about that. I'm talking about a hammer to put a nail in. Oh, that is awesome. Uh, what are you binge watching lately? What do I binge? You know what? I'll tell you what. One thing that I've probably say that I've watched a little bit more so over the last couple of years is Chicago PD or Chicago Fire. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of got hooked on those. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm the guy typically that will turn on the news and watch the Today Show in the morning mm -hmm. for the first 20 or 30 minutes. I, I enjoy watching that. Uh, you get to get caught up in what's happening with the news. And then typically... Although I haven't done it recently here, uh, mm -hmm. I like to watch the Weather Channel from time to time just because, hey, let's face it, with all the traveling you're doing, you know that you're going somewhere next week or the week after, and you want to have an idea of what the weather's like in that area. So, mm -hmm. uh, But I, I'd say the news or, or Chicago Fire and Chicago PD are, are the top top ones on the list. There you go. So favorite, on his own, all-time favorite PBA stop. We'll go stateside because I think – your your favorite stop overseas is Japan, right? Oh, of course. Or 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 I mean, did you like the IOF forces open in Markham? It was nice, but I didn't have the success that I had in Japan. Okay, you know, so, so Japan would take that. So inside the United States, would un, I say this? Fortunately, the Showboat Invitational in Las Vegas. Now, mm -hmm. unfortunately, they imploded it back there in, in the late nineties. So therefore, there is no more Showboat. So if I have to pick a place now that I really enjoy to go to, mm -hmm. oh boy, South Point's not bad. I've got some pretty good memories in South Point, and it's a nice facility to go to. Uh, the arena know. or the like the 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 60, 60 lane tournament center or the main bowling center? Eh, it, it wouldn't matter to me at that point. Matter. You know, they they kind of stick out. They're they're a little differently. Going to the arena, the nice thing about that is you can sit in some sort of stadium type seating that you can actually get comfortable and watch bowling okay. you know so th that part of it's pretty nice didn't they turn showboat into castaways uh no showboat was uh it, it might have been turned into castaways but they imploded it back somewhere right around 2000 
They brought it okay. down. Okay. Okay. All right. There we go. So least favorite stop. Least favorite stop. Wow. I don't know if I've got a least favorite stop because I, uh, I mean, some of the places we go to, it, it seems like, uh, we do good. I would say this, that if I had a least favorite stop, it's mm -hmm. only based on bowling ability. Mm -hmm. I have not bowled good. And I believe it's the Fire Lake Casino mm -hmm. that the players are going to here in about two weeks Yep, out in uh, the Tulsa area uh, or outside of Oklahoma City, somewhere over there mm -hmm. uh, in, in Oklahoma. It just hasn't been a very successful mind frame for Parker Bone. Now, keep in mind, we just started going there over the last six or seven years. So maybe I'm not quite on my A game that I would really be conducive or see and understand the lanes, but it has not turned out to be very prevailing at all. Okay. So PBA, what bowling center do you wish the PBA would go to? I think I know the answer. Uh, it's got to be Eastway Lanes in Erie, Pennsylvania. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yep. We, that place was electrified. Mm -hmm. They know bowling. That's a bowling city. Uh, you know, when I say city, it's probably, oh God, it, it's got to be pretty close to the same size as Portland, Maine. It really okay. is. It's okay. got similarities to it. But wow, do they know bowling there. And we went sure. to a 40 lane facility that the family kept the place up, tip top shape, and mm -hmm. they opened their arms and allowed the professional bowlers to come in their facility and the the news that we got, the the media that we got, the fan base that was there was incredible. Mm -hmm. so. so how about how about one that the PBA has never gone to? Like what what center has the PBA never gone to that you wish they would go to? Oh, man, that's that's kind of tricky there, because I don't know. You know, at, at the end of the day, uh, I will tell you this. I don't have the name of the center. Mm -hmm. But for as big of a state in bowling as the state of Minnesota is, we have never bowled a PBA national tour stop in mm -hmm. the state of Minnesota. Okay. Okay. So I would have to say it would have to be somewhere in Minnesota. Uh, they do have some nice facilities up there. Trust me. They've got some state-of-the-art places. And it would be really nice if the PBA tour actually went up there at some point. Mm-hmm. There we go. So did you enjoy school as a kid? What was your favorite subject? Math. Hands yeah. down. I was I was quick with numbers, buddy. I loved math. Would do it all day long, every day. So math wasn't my strong suit, but when I was when I was in school, I was in special ed my whole school life. And uh our teacher wanted to, you know, did this thing called calendar quiz. They just wanted to teach us how to use a calendar. And Apparently I ran with it considering what I said to you about half an hour ago, but, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, that's numbers is kind of my thing as well. I mean, just, I don't know why, but it's just one of those things that I'm good with numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, favorite hangout, not related to bowling. Favorite hangout, not related to bowling. It's going to be my house. Oh, that's boring, Parker. Come on. No, I'm just kidding. Going There you go. You know what? But well, <laughs> you, you say that's boring, Derek. But let me try to put this in perspective for you. Yeah, yeah. I spend 40 weeks a year out on the road doing my job. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you look at a calendar being 52 weeks long, yeah. that means I have 12 weeks of opportunity to be at my house. I got you. Now, keep this in mind. Where we just sold our house, we had an in-the-ground pool in the backyard. And I was the guy that opened it up every spring and closed it every fall and put all of the stuff out to make it look really wonderful, trim all the shrubs and make sure that our backyard looked immaculate for everybody else to use except me mm -hmm. because we had a summer tour. So therefore I'm out on the road. And if it wasn't the regular summer tour, it was the senior tour. Mm -hmm. So I cherish the moments and the times that I can I'm, be at my house. I I'm just totally busting. Yeah. I hope you know that. Um, so now you kind of alluded to this at the um, when you were being interviewed. Uh, I think you were talking about the um, what do you like about the U.S. Open or something like that. Um, there have been a lot of great bowlers that have 
left the quote unquote kids tour. Mm -hmm. How many more years you got? Uh, there's a possibility this could be my last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't know that for a fact. Uh, mm -hmm. I enjoyed bowling with my kids this year in the U S open. Mm -hmm. I can't stand here or sit. I'm sitting. So I can't sit here in front of you right now and say that if I'm eligible to enter it next year, will I, I can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the significance this year was the fact that we both bowled in it or, or all three of us bowled in it. Uh, we are all three going to bowl in the masters coming up. Mm -hmm. That's going to wow. be in Detroit. And I'll look forward to that too. But, uh, you know, if I bowl and I don't know how many I'm going to bowl, maybe a half a dozen, uh, maybe eight uh, events. If I mm -hmm. bowl in those and I have no productivity, why would I sign up again next year? Sure. You know, I don't mind doing it if I'm at least breaking even, obviously we want to do something that you're making a little bit of money, but, I think bowling in these events still continues to make me a better player when I go bowl in all of the other events. So, and there you go. You, we just went flush in the pocket with Parker bone, but uh, the, uh, so wasn't that an easy 300 game? My God, I wish they were all that easy. Right. <laughs> um, if everybody bowled with one hand, right. Where would you, where would you rank on tour? Do you think? Does it right. have anything to do with two handers or, or I mean, cause I know that guys like Norm Duke stopped, Walter Ray stopped, Pete Weber stopped. They just bowled the senior tour. Sure. Um, yeah. Is, is, is the two handed and the, the fact that they cover so many boards and they have so many revs, is that a factor? Where would you be if, if it, everybody just threw with one hand? Uh, I think that the two handed, obviously they can add their rev rate, but you mm -hmm. look at somebody like EJ Jackett, he has no problem getting rev rate. AJ Johnson, he has no problem getting rev rate. Mm -hmm. Look at somebody like Sean Rash, the power he possesses. Better yet, how about if I go to Jacob Buttruff on the left right. side? Right. Okay. I, I watch my own son, Brandon. You know, I, I see what he can do to a bowling ball. So uh, I'm not going to say that Parker Bone's going to be in the top 10 or 20. I may not be in the top 50, you know, at that point. But it just makes a significant difference. It's part of the wave of the future that we have to deal with. So whether you're one-handed or two-handed, and back to your original question, everybody that is one-handed, I'd say I would be lucky, lucky if I was in the top 50. Okay. Can I still repeat shots? Derek, I feel like I can repeat shots almost as good as I did back in the day. But at the end of the day, the power is still going to supersede over the long haul. I got to be honest, man. I love to watch Brandon throw it. I mean, the way, oh my God, that guy, I mean, both your kids are going to do great on tour. Um, so I definitely wish them a lot of luck. Um, well, and listen, man, uh, I got to be honest with you. Hero doesn't even begin to begin to describe you. Uh, you you've been, uh, you know, I was watching the, uh, like I said earlier, the, um, when I was a kid in 93 and you were winning in, uh, in Phoenix. And then somebody told me, Hey, in 20 years, you're going to call this guy one of your best friends. I would say they were lying. I really appreciate you doing this. Um, thank you for being as nice to me as you have been. You are near and dear to my heart, man. Thank you so much. And, uh, th this was uh flush in the pocket with Parker Bone. Thank you from the bottom well, of my heart. Very, you are certainly welcome. I'd be happy to come on again. All we got to do is connect the times, but more importantly, sure. you're a friend. You're always going to be a friend. From my heart right there, pal. Thank you, buddy. You. Thank you, we'll sir. See you again. All right, bud. You have a great one. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care, everybody. You too. You too. And uh, that was Parker Bone the third. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of a show tomorrow. Uh, I did I did forget to get his uh, prediction for the U.S. Open. Um, but, uh, you know, it took a lot of his time. So, uh, tomorrow's U S open is looking pretty good. So we have Kyle troop as the fifth seed and, you know, you have EJ Tackett as the one seed and it's just going to be interesting tomorrow. So we, uh, we may or may not talk about it. There will be no show next week because of the super bowl. So that'll be awesome. Thank you guys for watching. This has been flush in the pocket and, uh, you know, just uh, get out and go bowling. Talk to you soon.